All right, thank you. Got your Bibles? Hard copy, electronic copy? Let me ask you to get your Bibles ready and let's get at it. I'm glad to be here. I love the opportunity to teach the Word. I want to talk to you this weekend about being ordinary men who make hell shake. I want you to do this for me first. I want you to get your scriptures in front of you, whether your hard copy or your phone, your iPad. And I want you to just look at the word that you have. I want you to get two numbers in your head. It's a real simple exercise to get started. Here's, here's the first number. The number of people who live in your house today. That one should be pretty easy, yes? The number of people who live in your house. It's my wife and I, so two of us. Got that number in your head? All right, here's the second number I want you to get in your head. The number of Bibles you have in your house today. And I think I sense from your collective groan, you get my point. Most of us have more Bibles than we have human beings in our house. Yes? And I can take you to places around the world today where 2.8 billion people in the world have no access to the gospel. Never heard the name of Jesus. And you and I have the entirety of the Word of God in our language, in our possession, in front of us. And I can come here tonight and open up the Word of God. We can gather in a place like this, a large number of men, for the sake of talking out the gospel. And we do that without threat of our lives. God's been really good to us. So I'm, I'm adamant about when we have opportunity to get to the Word, then we get to the Word because God's given it to us to do that. And so let's go straight, first of all, to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. I want to start with this text because this text is really the theme text of my ministry and I'm going to preach on this uh, Sunday morning. So I'm not going to camp here. I just want to lay some, some groundwork for us here. Here's the scenario. The Apostle Paul is in the city of Ephesus, and it is a thoroughly pagan city. So much evil in the city that there are demonic forces and there are professional exorcists coming about trying to cast out the demons. And we read in verse 11, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. So again, pause there and get the picture. Evil all over the city, demonic spirits in the city, professional exorcists com coming into the city to cast out the demons. They find a man with a demon. There are seven sons of one man named Sceva, and they take on a demon. And they say to this demon, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, come out. They've heard that Paul has power. They've heard there's power in the name of Jesus. And so they say to the demon, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, come out. This time, though, the demon speaks back. This is verse 15. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but what's next? Who are you? Who are you? I, I, want us to, I want us to grab that because the demon says, Jesus I know, and he knows Jesus because he's the Son of God. Paul I know because Paul's walking with God. But to these exorcists, the demon says, who are you? In essence, the demon says, you don't scare me. You don't worry me. There's nothing about you. There's nothing about your life that threatens me. And here's my, here's my concern, men. I, I fear that the devil says to us in the North American church, beginning with those of us men in the room, I fear the devil says to us, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. You all just keep on doing what you're doing because you don't worry me anyway. And if we're going to make a dent in the darkness, it's going to begin with men in the church of God. It's going to begin with men in the church of God who are ordinary men who make hell shake. So that's what I want us to think about. How do we become those men who make hell shake? And we'll begin by looking at first in this session, our struggle with power. Our struggle with power. And here's what I want to do. 
I want to give you the point first, and then we're going to unpack some text. So let me give you the point. Here's point number one. God leads us into impossible situations so He alone might be our warrior. And then on your notes there, I've given you a place just to write some text. So get your Bibles ready, and we're going to start in the book of Exodus. And I'm going to walk you through several texts that will, in fact, show us this theme, beginning in Exodus chapter 14. God leads us into impossible situations, so He alone might be our warrior. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to take us through several different Old Testament texts in particular to look at this theme. How often does God lead us, even as leaders in His church, in the situations we cannot handle? And He does it with intentionality to show us that we can't handle it and to show us that He is, in fact, the one who fights the battles for us. I want to show you this so often, and we honestly could spend the next several hours. When I teach on spiritual warfare at the seminary, I spend a couple of weeks going from Genesis to Revelation looking at this very theme. I'm just going to pull out some highlights to show you this so that I hope we'll come out of this first session saying, no, maybe I need to let God fight my battles. Exodus chapter 14. Look with me at verse... 10 and following, God has brought His people to the Red Sea. If you remember the story, the sea is in front of them. The Egyptian army is coming after them. And let's see what we read in verse 10. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us and bring us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. So they're saying, what, why did you bring us out here? We've got a sea in front of us and they've never seen the sea divide before. Coming after them is the most powerful army in the world and they find themselves in a place of impossibility. So their leader stands up and says, look at verse 13. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. Look at verse 14. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Now, guys, help me. Look at verse 13. Tell me the things that Moses tells them to do. Listen to his battle plan. Here come the Egyptians. Here's the Red Sea. And what's the answer from Moses? Somebody just holler out for me. What's he tell them to do? Fear not. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. And what about you only have to be silent? Be quiet. I want you to imagine this. They can hear the army coming after them. They're looking to Moses for direction. Here's what he says. First of all, no reason to be afraid here. Two, just stand still. And three, just be quiet. Now you tell me, how much of that makes sense in this scenario? None of it does. Now, I don't know you, but I know myself well enough to know that, first of all, I would be scared silly, screaming, and swimming. I'd be, I'd be in the sea Try, and we, most of us would be, and here's why. Because we fix first and pray second. We do what we have to do first and then turn to the Lord. But what Moses says to the people is this, no, you've got to let the Lord fight for you, and if you're going to let the Lord fight for you, He has to do it, not you. God's brought you to this place. He's brought you to this place where you're sandwiched between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army. And yes, it is a place of impossibility, but it's not impossible when God fights for you. The Lord will fight for you. Then watch what happens. Go to verse 23 of the same chapter. I want to show you that when God fights for us, the world takes note. The world recognizes when God is our warrior. 
Chapter 14, verse 23. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. So they've gone after the Hebrews who've crossed on dry ground. And verse 24 says, And in the morning watched the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud, looked down on the Egyptian forces, and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Now listen to the rest of this. Let us flee from before Israel. Why? For the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Now, here's what's fascinating about that. If you know anything at all, if you remember anything at all from your world history, did the Egyptians have their own gods? Yeah, they had bunches of gods. They had all kinds of gods. So what are they saying when, they're say, when they say, we've got to run from Israel because their Lord fights for them? You know what they're saying? The Hebrew God is much more powerful than our gods. It's God's making himself known by leading his people into a place of impossibility. God always does that. He leads us into a place that we can't handle that he might be our warrior. And let's keep looking. God's given us the entirety of his word, so let's look at it. Go with me to the book of, of Judges. The book of Judges. This time, chapter 7, a story many of you would likely be aware of, but I want you to hear it in this context. Judges chapter 7, God's leading his people into a place of impossibility. Judges chapter 7, verse 2. It's the story of Gideon preparing to take on the Midianites. I want you to listen to what God says here. The Lord said to Gideon, The people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. So God's people, here's the situation. They're prepared to go into battle. 32,000 warriors to take on the Midianites. What does God say is the problem with that army? It's too big. How often do we hear that? So we think about invading. We think about more warriors, not fewer. Here's what God says. Your army's too big. And why is the army too big? Because if they win, what will they do? They'll take credit. They'll say, I did that. And God does not share credit with anybody. So he says, your army is too big. Send everybody home is afraid. 22,000 take off. 10,000 remain. And here's what God says in verse 4. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. And he takes them down to the water. Do you remember how many are left eventually? 300. Again, think about this if you're, if you're Gideon, if you're anybody there. You're ready to take on the enemy. You're ready with an armed force of 32,000 people. You're ready to go. God says it's too big. You reduce it. God says it's still too big. Now you're down to 300, and God says now you're ready. And if you remember the rest of the story, even his battle plan is weird. He sends them in the battle. They're going to break pictures and scream things, and God is going to give them the victory. And when God does that, who alone gets the glory? God does. So they're ready to fight the battle in the first part. And says, no, God says, no, you can do this on your own, and I'm not going to let you do that. I'm going to put you in a place of impossibility. I'm going to reduce you. I'm going to make you weaker. so that I can use you. And I want you to hear that because that's a central theme of the scriptures. We're going to come back to that. 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Again, another story that uh, you likely know, but I want you to hear it against this backdrop of this theme throughout the scriptures that God leads us into impossible situations so that he alone might be our warrior. 
And that's the story of David and Goliath. Now, we, we teach this story to our kids, and rightly so, we need to. But I don't want us to miss what God teaches us here. It's this theme, again, just echoes throughout the Bible. Here's the deal. Hebrew armies on one side, the Philistine armies on one side, they send warriors into the valley. One fights against one. The Philistines send out their giant and nobody will take him on. Well, let's see why. Look with me at verse 4 of 1 Samuel 17. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head. He was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. Now, let me unpack that for you. Listen to the detail we get about this giant and tell me how often we get this kind of detail in the scriptures. Here's what we learn about him. He's nine feet, nine inches tall. He wears armor that weighs 125 pounds, just his armor weighs 125 pounds. And we're told even enough detail that we learn that the head of his spear weighs 15 pounds. This guy has a bowling ball on the end of his spear. And we're given all of that detail. Nine feet, nine inches tall, 125 pounds, 15 pounds on his spear. What does the writer want us to know about this guy? This is a big dude, right? We we seldom get this kind of detail in the scripture. So obviously the writer wants us to get something. There's a reason nobody will take him on. It's impossible to defeat him. There's a reason the the Hebrew army stands aside and everybody's afraid from the king on down to take him on. Because he's too big. Well, then let me show you how David's introduced in this chapter. Look at verse 14, the same chapter. The sons of Jesse are introduced. Some of them have gone to the battle. But then we read about David in verse 14. David was what? The youngest. Look at how he's introduced. He's the youngest. The three elders followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So what does David do? He's a shepherd. Now look at look what the writer's doing. He's setting us up. Here's the giant. Now we meet David. He's the youngest of Jesse's sons, which means he's the least likely to be the leader. He's hardly a warrior. He takes care of sheep. Well, David's wondering, why will nobody fight this giant? And finally, David says, I'll go take him on. Word comes to the king. Look at verse 31, same chapter. Verse 31. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them for Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Felicia to fight with him, for you are but what? What's the text say? A youth. See, that's the second time we learn he's a youth. He's a boy. And he has been a man of war from his youth. So look at the comparison again. What does the writer show us? David is but a boy. It's the second time we hear it. What do we now learn about the warrior? He's been a warrior how long? From his youth. So he is not only huge, he's not only well-armed, he's also well-trained, and he's also experienced. And what's David? He's only a, a boy. It's impossible for David to win this battle. Well, Saul gives David some armor. He takes that off. He's not going to wear that. He picks up some rocks and puts them in his shepherd's pouch, and away he goes. And we're set up to think this is crazy. In fact, watch what happens in uh, verse 42. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but what? A youth. How many times have we heard that now? Three times. You hear that kind of repetition in the Bible? The writer wants us to know David is just a boy. He's taking on the giant. He disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. So apparently the giant didn't like David because he was handsome too. Uh, The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? 
And the Philistine cursed David by his God. So he calls on his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Now watch what David says in verse 45. And let the word of God just become living for you. Listen to what it says here. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. Now, what's he mean by that? Well armed, and you're coming to me like human beings fight. You're coming to me the way we always do it. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And then listen to what David says in verse 46. And let me just say to you if you're speaking, if you're a boy with just some rocks in your pocket, and here's this nine feet, nine inch tall giant in front of you, well armed, and even a shield bearer in front of him. And you're going to talk to a giant like David is about to talk to the giant. You better be really sure God's with you. Just, just listen to what he says. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. David says, not only am I going to do this, but God's name is going to be glorified. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear. He doesn't do it the way we do it. For the battle is whose? The Lord's. And He will give you into our hand. See, here's the theme. God is our warrior and the battle is the Lord's. Now, help me, men. If God's our warrior and the battle is the Lord's, what, what are we pretty much assured of? We, we ought to be living in victory, yes? If God's our warrior and the battle is His, nobody can beat Him. Why then do we lose the battles so often? Because we fight in our own strength. And men are notorious for that. We fight first and turn to God second. And David says, uh-uh, it's not even my battle. It's God's battle. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20. This is actually my favorite of these stories in the Old Testament. And if it were not tragic, it would be comical. Here's, here's the scenario. Three armies in the first part of this chapter have united together. They are now allies to come against the people of God. The Moabites and the Ammonites and some of the Munites. That's chapter 20, verse 1. They've come against Jehoshaphat the king, and they're going to battle against the people of God. Word comes to the king. These armies are coming. They're coming to get you. The king, to his credit, calls Israel to fast and to pray. And he begins to pray. And look at verse 12 of chapter 20 and listen to his prayer. He sees the armies gathering against them. They find themselves in an impossible situation. And here's what he prays. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. Listen to the impossibility there. We're powerless, he says. But here's what I love about this verse. The rest of this verse, if you're comfortable underlining or highlighting in your Bible, do that. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I love that text because here's what the king says. When I don't have a clue what to do, I do know what to do. And that's lock my eyeballs on the one who is our warrior. We get in trouble because we take our eyes off of God. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. So they're looking to God now, and God gives a word to Jehaziel. Look at verse 15, same chapter, and listen to what he says. And he said, listen, all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed at this great horde, for the battle is not yours, but whose? It's God's. Now watch the battle plan in verse 16. Tomorrow go down against them. Behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. You will find them at the end of the valley, east of the wilderness of Jeruel. 
you will not need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, and see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid and do not be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them and the Lord will be with you. So what's the battle plan here in verse 17? Go out there and do what? Nothing. Just go out there. You don't need to fight in this battle. Stand firm, hold your position, see the salvation of the Lord on your behalf. See, if you look at this text closely, it begins with the prophet saying, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. Then he gives them the battle plan. You don't have to fight. Just go out there and stand. Let the Lord do it. And then he ends that battle plan with, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. wonder why he tells them twice, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. You know why I think he tells them twice? Because the battle plan in between is crazy. Just go out there and stand there and let the Lord fight. But God's the warrior. Now there's another part of this plan. Go to verse 20. This is where it begins to get comical as we watch what God does. And they arose early in the morning and went out in the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. Believe his prophets and you will succeed. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went out before the army and say, Give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love endures forever. And they begin to sing and pray. So what's, what's this part of the battle plan? He does send somebody out. And who is it? It's the choir. It's the praise team. It's the singers. They're going out before the army, and they begin singing together, give thanks to the Lord for His steadfast love endures forever. Now watch what happens. Remember, there are three armies. Moab, Ammon, Mount Seir, listen to what happens in verse 22. And when they began to sing in praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. For the men of Ammon and Moab rose against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, devoting them to destruction. Now, watch this. Three armies, they're gathered against the people of God. The people of God are watching. They send the choir out to start singing. As they're singing, two of the three armies turn on the third one and wipe them out. Remember, they're allies. But now two wipe out the third and then keep reading. And when they had made an end to the inhabitants of Seir, they all helped to destroy one another. So you've got two armies left. They turn on each other, wipe each other out. Three armies start, two kill the third, then the other two kill each other. Meanwhile, the choir is singing, give thanks to the Lord. That's the picture. And who alone has to get the glory there? God does. You see what he does? He said to his people, I'm putting you in an impossible situation. You can't win this fight the way I'm telling you to fight it. But I can. God takes them into the impossible that he might be their warrior. And Jehaziel says the same word. The battle's not ours. The battle is the Lord's. Now, let me, let me show you the problem here. I want you to back up with me now to go to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. 1 Chronicles chapter 21. I want you to see the issue here. And I particularly want us to think about this as men, as leaders. 1 Chronicles 21, verse 1, we're back to David. Only this time he's not the shepherd boy, he's the king. He's now risen to power over the kingdom. And Satan gets involved in chapter 21, verse 1. Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel, to take a census. So David said to Joab and the commanders of the army, Go, number Israel, from Beersheba to Dan, from one city to the other, and bring me a report that I may know their number. So he wants to know something. He wants to know numbers, some kinds of numbers. We'll see that in a minute. Verse 3, But Joab said, May the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. Are they not, my Lord the King, all of them my Lord's servants? Why then should my Lord require this? Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel? So Joab, 
One of David's leaders gets in his face and says, David, don't do this. He recognizes that somehow this is sinful. Verse 4, but the king's word prevailed against Joab. And Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came back to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to David. Now watch who gets reported here. It's critical. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 men who drew the sword, and in Judah, 470,000 who drew the sword. So who gets reported? It's not just everybody, but who is it? The ones who draw the sword, so they are what? They are the, the warriors. They're the army. And God is so displeased with David's doing this that he plagues the entire nation. Now, why is this a sin? Well, what did David really want to know? Think about it. If he's saying, go out and number my armies, what does he really want to know? How powerful he is. How mighty he is. How strong he is. How tough he is. How much he can take on. And God judges the whole nation because of his attitude. Why is that a problem for David? Who's supposed to be their warrior? God is. God is. Now tell me this, men. Why is this such a sin for David in particular? Think about everything we've read, even over the last few moments. Why is this such a sin for, for David? David's the leader. That's good. He's taking the glory from God. Why else is this such a problem for David? He's trusting himself. Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Think about this. David knows better. Why does he know better? Because he was the shepherd boy. Because he saw the hand of... It was David who said, the battle is not ours, it is the Lord's. It's David who said, I'll take on the giant with just some rocks and a sling because God's my warrior. But now it's also David who says, let me count my forces. Now, hear me out here. I want you to, I want you to think about what happens here. I want you to see what happens in this picture. See, David's a picture of what happens to most of us. I want you to think about it. I don't know, I assume most of you in this room are, are believers. I want you to think back to when you first became a believer. Do you remember the days when you had no idea how to read the Word? You had no idea how to tell the story. You had no idea how to pray. You had no idea how to fight temptation. You remember the days when all you, all you could do was figure out how to put one foot in front of the other and trying to follow Jesus? Remember, you just had to lean on everybody else to teach you. I became a believer at age 13 out of a non-Christian home. I had no clue other than the fact that God saved me. I had no idea what that meant. I knew God had rocked my world, but I didn't know how to read the Scriptures. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to tell my story. I didn't know how to defend my faith. All I knew is that God loved me. And here's what I had to do. I absolutely, fundamentally had to lean on God. I had to depend on him every step of the way. And that's where we often start. That's where David was as the shepherd boy. But by 1 Chronicles 21, give him some experience. Give him some years in his walk with God. Give him some power. Give him some prestige. Give him some people who report to him. Give him a leadership position. And where does he lean now? Not on God, but on what? On himself. See, man, I, I want you to think about this. Most of us, most of us, the longer we're believers, the more our greatest days of dependence were in the yesterdays of our life. I'm going to say that again. The longer we're believers, for most of us, our greatest days of dependence, where we just trusted the Lord to be our warrior, are not in the present tense of our life. They're in the yesterdays of our life. And I'm pretty much convinced that the higher you go up in the leadership ladder of a church, the more authority you have, the more position you have, the more power you have, the more people who look to you, the easier it is to become like David the king. 
And you know what God has to do when we get to be David the king? God has to break us to make us David the shepherd boy again. And He does that because He loves us. You see, men who fight their own battles will never threaten hell. Because when we fight our own battles, we fight in our own power. And our own power isn't strong enough to take on the enemy. So I want, you to, I want you to think about this just for a minute, and I want to take us to one more text. I want you to think about your own life. Be gut-level honest where you are tonight. How dependent are you on the power of God for every step of your life? Do you turn to God first and depend on Him? Or do you fight the battle first and turn to God only when you have to? And one simple way to evaluate that is to look at your prayer life. We're going to talk about prayer some tomorrow and talk about how men need to be praying for men. I'm going to show you a simple way to do that. But look at your own prayer life. If your prayer life is always in response to a problem, you're fighting first and then turning to God. It's backwards. It's absolutely backwards. You're more like David the king than David the shepherd boy, and you've forgotten that God's to be the warrior. Are you more like the shepherd boy, trusting God, or more like the king, saying, I'm okay. I'm pretty strong on my own. I can handle the battles on my own. And men, hear me. We live in a culture that makes this all countercultural. I'm talking to you about men becoming weak under the hand of God that God alone might get the glory. And that's contrary to the way that we think. But the strongest warriors in the scriptures are those who let God fight the battle. Do you remember when the, when the Hebrews wanted a king? Tell me why they wanted a king. Has everybody else had a king? Remember that? Go back with me to 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. The people are demanding a king. And Samuel warns them. In fact, he says to them, you don't, you don't really want a king. Because if you, if you get a king, he's going to take your stuff and he's going to take your children. He's going to take control of you. And while you say you want a king, you really don't. And you're right. You, you got it that they say we want a king because all the other nations have a king. But it's really funny to me. I ask this question all over the world. And for some reason, we remember only one part of that story. What we remember is they wanted a king because everybody else had a king. What we forget is the rest of the story. Look with me at verse 19 of chapter 8, 1 Samuel. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations. Now, that's what we remember, but don't miss the rest of these verses. And then our king may judge us and do what? Go out before us and fight our battles. Now, what's the problem with that? Who's supposed to be fighting their battles? God is. So why do they say we want a king that fights our battles? Here's what they're saying. We want a warrior we can see. We want a warrior who goes out in front of us and we can see him out there leading the charge. Not a God that we have to trust when we can't see him. See what they say, when we want a king we can see, they're erasing faith from the equation. If you have to see the king who leads you, you don't have to have faith. But our call as men of God is to trust God as our warrior, believing and trusting that he will fight the battles for us. Believing that if he says to us, you just go out there and stand there and let me take care of it, he'll take care of it. Believing if he calls us to put some rocks in our pocket and take on the biggest giant in the land, that he'll take that giant down. 
believing that if he tells us, go out there, send the choir out and sing, and if it makes no sense to you, I'll still be your warrior, we believe that he'll do it. But here's our problem. Our problem is this. We fight too much in our own ability. We fight too much in our own ability. And I've already given you some, some symptoms of that. Just evaluate your own life for a minute. Do you fix first and pray second? Do you fight the battle first and pray second? Do you even begin to think about solutions before you seek the wisdom of God? And even in general, even in general, is your prayer life reactive or proactive? If you don't start praying until you're facing something you can't fix, then you tend to be your own warrior. And here's, here's the point of this first session. When we're fighting our own battles, we do not threaten hell. Because there is absolutely nothing within us powerful enough, godly enough, strong enough to make the devil shake. The only way we make hell shake is if God fights the battles for us. And you know how we get there? We, we recognize that apart from God, we really are nothing. And that's really hard for men to think about because our whole life is built upon let's achieve, let's achieve, let's protect, let's do. And I'm not arguing against any of those things, but I want you to see that our tendencies get in the way of this whole understanding. Because we're accustomed to achieving. And what we need God to do most of the time is remind us that apart from Him, we're just sinners destined for a real hell. And were it not for the mercy of God in our life and the grace of God poured into our life, we wouldn't do a thing that we're doing. And I'll tell you guys, and I'll, I'll say this and I'll, I'll stop and we'll take a break. I'll let Eric give us direction there. I'm 55 years old. I don't know how much longer the Lord has for me in ministry. I've been doing ministry since I was 20 years old, so a lot of years. I, I have in my file somewhere at my house a picture that I drew when I was a very young pastor. I started pastoring full-time at 20. had no idea what I was doing. But I drew, I drew, I still don't know what I'm doing, but I guarantee you I didn't then. Uh, I drew this picture of me standing behind the pulpit, and behind me was this banner that said, Chuck Lawless, Southern Baptist Convention President. And you know, I've, I've been in Southern Baptist life now for three decades, and longer than that, actually, four decades. I look back at that picture, and I think, what was I smoking back then? Uh, what, was, what, was I th what was I thinking about? And you know, God's been incredibly gracious to me to let me work for the International Mission Board to serve as dean and vice president at Southeastern. I get to travel the world. I get, to, I get to hang out with my students. I get to speak at churches all over the place. But you know what I'm, I'm learning? The titles don't matter. The positions don't matter. You know what I'm learning? You resign one place and they've replaced you before you're ever out the door. And that's right, because the kingdom's work has to go on. And if we live for our name and for our position and our glory and our stuff, it's all going to burn. It doesn't matter. What I do want to know is that when God allows me to do ministry, that hell shakes a little bit. 
I do want to know that the demons themselves don't like our gathering here. But that won't happen just because we've gathered here. It will happen because we decide, Lord, I don't want to fight my own battles anymore. So you do what you have to do to remind me that I'm just an ordinary man in need of the deep, deep, deep grace of God. Let me, let me pray. Father, thank you for this beginning. Thank you for your word. God, you're so good to give us your word. To allow us to have it in its entirety. And even, even Lord, I'm reminded that we just in the last in the last 45 minutes or so, spent more time in your word than billions of people will ever do in their whole lifetime. So God, I don't want to do this stuff in my power. Lord, I know I do. I know I do every day. I know how much I rely on my training. and I know how often I'm David the king and not David the shepherd boy. So God, though it scares me to pray this way, I pray that you would... You would break me if that's what's necessary. God, I pray that you would speak to the lives of men in this room tonight. Perhaps leaders, perhaps aspiring leaders, perhaps those that are struggling. God, I pray that you would bring us to the end of ourselves, that we'd be okay with being ordinary because it's not about us anyway. It's about you, an extraordinary God, who fights the battles for us. So, Lord, open our hearts. Inch us toward a willingness to say, Lord, do what you must to make me David the shepherd boy again. Break the kingliness out of me that you'll be my warrior. Now, Father... Continue to speak to us. Bless our few moments of, of fellowship and fun. And thank you again for this church and the opportunity to come and do this work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.